started. So today I want to talk about uh, linear models for regression. Also um, cover a little bit of the pre-processing we didn't cover last week. Uh, I didn't realize that the homework actually had some missing data in the uh, first data set. I think the yes, in the first one. So we'll also cover uh, how to deal with missing data today. Um, so you have that for the homework. So that's actually what I want to talk uh, about first, is um, how to deal with missing values in data. So I already gave you like uh, um, a teaser in that in the first homework, because the first homework had like lots of missing values that you needed to count. Um, and as you see, saw there, missing values can be encoded in many different ways. So NumPy right now doesn't have a standard format to encode missing values. Scikit-learn usually uses np.nan, but you can configure it. Uh, in PANDAS, actually, there is a missing value uh, data type. But uh, usually, you don't get your data as like a NumPy array or a PANDAS data frame. So one get, often gives you a text file. And um, so there, often, it's encoded either as a string or as a missing value. You can have question mark, three question marks, NA, unknown. Um, in my in the homework for I think it was last year, in homework three, there was a data set that I got from the city of Boston. No, that was the city of New York, sorry, where each column had the missing value encoded differently. It was encoded by nines, but the number of nines was according to the maximum value in that column. So in one column, missing value was 99, in another column it was 9999, another column was 9999999. So, and this was a data set from the city of New York, right? They encoded it this way. It's not something I made up to make their high, uh, life hard. It's like, data in the real world is terrible. The data set you actually have for the first homework was created as um, an instructional data set, so it's much nicer than anything you'll see in the real world. All right, um, so, how, so now there's missing data. What are we gonna do with it? Most of the algorithms require all of the features to be available at all times. And so what we're gonna talk about is how we can um, e either replace uh, the missing data or drop the missing data. One thing that I want to um, point out is that often whether something's missing or not is informative. So if you look at medical data, for example, if a, a doctor orders a test, that's usually very indicative of what a um, diagnosis is. If you don't observe the outcome of a test, that, that means the, or, uh, the doctor didn't order this test, which means the doctor had some opinion about what, uh, whether it will be helpful or not. So this is often called um, structural missingness. So there's some reason in the process why the value is missing. And in real world data sets, most of the missingness is structural in some way. And so it's good to, before we say fill in or drop the missing values, to encode that the missing value was present. In scikit-learn, you can do that using the missing indicator. And so the idea here is that basically just the absence of a value is informative in itself. The opposite of that is um, an assumption that's called missing completely at random, which basically means that um, things are just randomly missing, like someone spilled a coffee over your spreadsheet or something, which is not usually what happens. Usually there's a reason why, thing, why things weren't measured. All right, so as an example in this lecture, I will um, use a version of the iris data set that I kind of manipulated to have some missing values in here. So this is a subset of the iris data set. And um, now imagine your first column, your first feature is mostly missing. In this case, it might be safe to just drop the first column. It's relatively unlikely there's information if the value is missing most of the time. If it not being missing is informative, so if I know there's something special about this column, or if there's something special about this column because I measured a value, then I might wanna keep this. 
So in the medical setting, it might actually be if a doctor ordered a very rare test, that they ordered this test uh, has very strong implications. But most of the time, if you don't have a feature available, um, it, it might be safe to drop it. Another situation might arise where for some data points, most of the columns are missing. So basically, you have rows of missingness. Um, here, you can also be tempted to uh, just drop these rows. If somewhere everything is missing, it might be very hard to come up with a prediction for this. One thing you should keep in mind, though, if you drop rows is, oh, uh, you should think about whether there will be missing data during the deployment or during your production phase. Because um, during a production phase, you're usually not allowed to drop data points. So if you don't have a way to deal with missing values and a point with missing values uh, comes up uh, in production, then your problem's just going to error out, which is probably not what you want. Uh, obviously, you can, in some settings, uh, basically punt and say, okay, I don't have enough information to make a decision and have some fallback. But uh, you should keep in mind that unless there's something specific about the data, you have to deal with missing values in the test set or in the production setting, and then just dropping them might not be an option anymore. But let's say we don't, let's say we don't have just rows or columns missing, but we have missingness all over the place. Um, but not so much as that we think it's, uh, the features are uninformative. So the most common way to deal with missing values is uh, to impute them, so to fill them in with some other value. And so um, the rest of the section, I want to talk about the different methods that we can use to fill in the missing values. There's basically um, sort of four different methods, um, using mean or median, using Kenyer's neighbors, um, doing regression-based imputation, and matrix factorization. Um, I'm not going to talk about matrix factorization at all. Um, right now in scikit-learn, there's only the mean and median imputation. There's pull requests for the K and M imputation and for the regression models. And I'm going to show you how to use them. Hopefully, they will be in, excuse me, in the next version of Scikit-Learn. I'll have a running example here of um, this data set, which is a subset of Iris, where I drop a bunch of values in the um, in the third and the fourth column. This is like a completely synthetic data set in a sense, because I just uh, made it up. And um, so, I have this as a running example. But don't um, like look too hard at the numbers that, you actu that we actually get out of this, because it doesn't really reflect what's happening in the real world. All right, so here, as, um, as a baseline, I'm just dropping the columns that have any NaN. So here, missing values were only in the third and the fourth column. So I can just um, still kind of drop them, and I get some. Um, accuracy value, which is 77%. The iris data set is very redundant, so even though if we completely drop half the columns, uh, we can still do pretty well. So the next step up from the baseline is using mean or median. So here I use um, the median strategy. The imputer is or imputation is implemented in the simple imputer in the impute module on scikit-learn. So right now the impute module only has the simple imputer and the missing indicator, um, but we'll get the other models there soon. So this is just implemented as a transformer, so it can fit it on the training data set, which will compute the mean or the median, in this case the median, for each of the columns, and then we will fill in uh, a missing value with the median on the training data set. So you can see here, that whenever there was a missing value, in this column it was replaced by 4.116. So all of them have the same value now. And here, in the last column, it was always replaced by 1.462.
this is actually a pretty decent baseline. And um, this is what I want you to do for the homework. So it's pretty simple, just use the simple imputer uh, with either median or mean strategy. Usually in practice, it doesn't make a lot of difference. And then you basically don't have to worry about um, missing values anymore. Again, this is something you want to fit only on a training set, so this would be part of your um, standard pipeline. So for this data set, I actually, I put all the missing values in the green class. Uh, I don't know which of the uh, three classes that this is. So there's actually very, the missingness is actually very informative, but also the distribution of missing values is very skewed. So here, the, the circles, are, um, so these are the sorry. These are the two columns that have missing values. I projected on just these two columns that have missing values, and I imputed them on the training set. The circles are points where I observed both of the values. The squares are points where um, where I made an imputation, and you can see that basically everything here that had a missing value in the first feature was projected to this, and everything that had a missing value in the second feature was projected to this. Whereas the green points originally were up here. So here the mean imputation didn't work very well, but that's mostly because I constructed a data set so that it fails. This is a little bit unrealistic because, um, well, um, the distribution after some of the values went missing is quite different from the distribution originally. Okay, but we can still try this. So here, the top is the baseline. That, wait, interestingly, now has a different outcome because we use a different random seed. Um, so, okay, the top uh, is the baseline, um, which has 79% um, accuracy, and below, we'll use a simple imputer, and we get uh, about 93% accuracy. So again, this is not super surprising given that I constructed a data set in a way that this will fail. Um, so the next step up in complexity is uh, Kainer's neighbor imputation. So the way that this works is you find the Kainer's neighbors. Um, so okay, let's say for a data point that has some missing value, we find the Kainer's neighbors that have um, this particular value not missing. The, and then we fill in um, the missing value using the average of these. So let's say I set k equal to three. I look at row number three, sorry, at column number three. I want to fill in column number three. So for a particular data point, I look at neighbors that have column number three not missing. I compute the three closest neighbors, and then I compute the mean. Um, one slight trick here is what are neighbors in the presence of missing values? And there's like, um, like a trick, there's like a slight trick how you can compute distances even though not all features are present. Basically, you compute di distances just on the features that are present. And um, yeah. so this is something like mean or Euclidean distance, but it's not super important. But basically, the idea is okay, we do k nearest neighbor and then we use mean imputation. In, uh, the mean of the nearest neighbors. If we do this on this data set, it actually looks uh, quite a bit better. Huh. Last time I looked at this plot, this point wasn't here, but uh, that's how it happens. So here I'm using the K and N imputer. As I said, that's not merged in scikit learn yet. Um, standard scalar logistic regression. And uh, if we do this, we actually get um, about 85% accuracy, so much better than any of the other models so far. And here is the uh, imputed training data set, and you can see the green points. Actually, so that the green squares mostly uh, end up over here, which is where they should be. So how it works is, if let's say if you only have the X feature, you just look at points with a similar X feature and then take the average of its neighbors to get the Y feature. So, Maybe this this is um, maybe this plot is a little bit confusing. I should have explained it better. This is the data set is four dimensional. We have the iris data set, 
um, there's two features that are in the way a constructor has the feature, two features that are always present, and there's two features that are sometimes missing. I'm only showing the two features that are sometimes missing because I left my four-dimensional monitor at home. But so um, here, basically, all of these data points have two features that are present at which I can always compute the distances. And like the x and the y features, they're sometimes present. And if they're present, I'm going to compute the distances using all three features. Otherwise, I'm going to use only two features. But yeah, so basically, you compute distances using all the values that are not missing. I mean, I'm not sure entirely if I understand the question, but I mean, this is, yeah, this, this is also machine learning. Like, doing the imputation is um, a step in the, in the machine learning pipeline. So, and actually the thing we're going to go to next is even more obviously machine learning. So, um, so I, I'm not sure, does it, did it, did this answer the question? What was the question? Oh, yes, we, we definitely we need to figure out what is the best uh, method for imputation. Yes, so we, we have to, there's many different pre-processing methods for everything, and in any case, we always have to pick which one to use. Though the, um, doing, using the mean or the median is actually quite decent. And so it's much faster than using K and N, for example. All right, and um, the last method I want to talk about is uh, model-driven imputation. Um, it's called iterative imputer in scikit-learn in the next release. So basically, here we train a regression model, and we can use any, any regression model we want to predict the missing value given all the other features. Usually the way this is done is um, we started off by doing something simple like mean imputation, and then um, we iterate over the columns and uh, for each column, we use this column as a target, and we use the other columns as features. We train a regression model whenever the column is not missing, and then we predict using the regression model on the missing values. So we actually use a supervised learning uh, model to fill in the missing values. And then we can iterate this, so we can iterate this over all the columns first. After we did this, the data set changed because we filled in the values in a better way, hopefully. And then we can do another sweep of the data set and try to fill in things again. Um, so one commonly used model here, because it works well for everything, is uh, random forests. So I can use a random forest, for example, to um, predict the missing feature given the other features. Um, yeah, and in this case here, it worked about as well as the K and N imputation. Um, in training random forest or any regression model compared to um, the nearest neighbor is obviously s uh, slower because nearest neighbor doesn't need to train. But if you want to do, do the filling in on a big data set, then the K and N is probably very slow. As we said, um, I think two weeks ago, um, the K nearest neighbor model needs to compare with every other data point, and so computing all these distances is um, very slow. And so using a model-based approach might be faster. Okay, the question is why do I want to iterate and why do I want to redo this? So imagine each data point has um, two features missing, but they're always diff two different features. If I want to predict one of the missing features, I need to use the value of the other missing feature. And so, hmm? okay, let's, um, because 
on the whole data set, no feature might be always available. So if I discard everything that doesn't have the feature available, I might have no data left. So in, the, in this synthetic example, basically, I made sure that there's always this overlap on these two features, but in reality, each feature might be missing sometimes. And uh, you'll chuck out a lot of data if you do that. Okay, uh, the question is, what does it mean if we have a row of, of all NANDs? And I mean, you have some information because you know none of these were measured. And so you could say, okay, all of these were missing and you can possibly encode this. But like, what does it mean is a very philosophical question. I don't think I can, I can answer that in general. Um, if there's no structure to your data or the missingness is not for any particular reason, um, and you don't think there's information in the missingness, then you have no information whatsoever, and you can predict the mean of your data set, which is not be the best, but then you have some prediction. Or you can say, well, I have no, not enough information, um, I'm not gonna make a prediction at all. All right. So, yeah, I, sh I should have have made a figure for this, but I didn't. Um, I apologize. But so basically, you start off with doing an imputation that fills in all the missing values, like a mean imputation. Now there's no missing data anymore, and I can train any model I want, right? And so now I start training my model, but I fill in only the uh, columns. Sorry, I fill in only the values that were previously missing. So, by doing like an initial sweep of doing all the mean imputations, I can train a mod on everything. Yep. So, uh, do we have to make sure uh, the, the model we use, the, 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 the model we use uh, before we find the missing value, uh, uh, before we check the missing value, and after we check <coughs> all the missing value and we want to uh, have a new model, do we, make sure, do we need to make sure this new model is not, uh, is not the same? Like, we, we use uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question, sorry. Um, I mean, uh, I mean the, 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 the prediction task here is predicting a feature, which is different than predicting the target, right? So it's gonna not help you predict a target. Okay. All right, so yeah, as I said, for I mean, I wanted to go over these uh, mutation methods, um, just sort of you're aware of them. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit hard to do with scikit-learn right now. You can check out the feature branches if you're really interested. But for the homework, as I said, I suggest just use the mean uh, or median imputation. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, walk through before we go to actual doing, uh, linear regression finally is talk about a little bit about the feature engineering aspects that we didn't have time for last week. Um, because they're actually quite important for uh, linear models in particular. So um, let's come back to this data set. It's like a synthetic data set where I have four blobs that uh, assume two of them belong to class, class green, two of them belong to uh, class gray. If I train a linear model, it will give me a linear decision boundary, which means a line somewhere in this space. Clearly, this um, cannot be this problem cannot be solved by a line. No matter where I draw a line, it will not be able to separate the two classes. And so this shows that particular in lower dimensional spaces, so here I only have two input dimensions. Um, Linear models might not be very powerful and they're quite restricted. But we can get over this restriction by adding in uh, new features. 
One way to add in a new feature is um, what I showed here, which is we take the original data, and then so each stack does a horizontal concatenation. Um, so I keep the original X, and then I take out the first feature and the second feature, and I just multiply them point-wise. And uh, as I told you in the visualization lecture, trying to visualize a 3D um, projection always completely fails, and you can't really see what's happening. But um, so basically, we went from having these two input features to having three features, where the third feature is just a product of the first two features. So we didn't really add any new information, but we expanded uh, the space, which gives the linear model, a linear model more flexibility. Now if I build a linear model in the new space and I project down, um, I can get this decision boundary in black here. So the black is a linear model on the three-dimensional space, and it actually solves the problem. Compared to the blue model in the two-dimensional space that's unable to solve the problem. So, um, one particular kind of um, interactions or products that I wanted to point out is uh, products between uh, continuous and categorical features. So, I, I briefly had this example up before. So let's say you have uh, data about uh, users on your website, their age, articles, uh, bond, gender, dollar spent, time online. So now we, ha we can use one-hot encoding to um, encode the gender. Either I could encode it using just one column of zero and one, or here I made, created two columns um, for like a standard one-hot encoding. So if I train a model on this, I would now get um, basically one feature for, uh, sorry, one coefficient for age, one coefficient for articles, one coefficient for being female, and one coefficient for being male. However, if I add the interactions, then um, I get basically the product of um, the gender and all of these. And so I have a feature I call HM. HM is the gender is male times all the features, or times age. Article spot M is gender M times article spot, and so on. And so um, for points uh, labeled M, the, it's just a copy of the original feature vector. For a point labeled F, it's zeros. And so now I basically doubled the original feature space and now I can have different coefficients for uh, how does the response depend on age for male users versus for female users. So now I can have um, much more flexibility. Usually I would keep the original model, so I would keep these things and then would add in these new features which are interactions. Okay, the question is, how do you um, impute categorical variables? And uh, the two uh, suggestions were, um, do you just pick the mode, or do you add a new category, an A? And both of these are probably good uh, strategies. I think most commonly, you will um, just make it a separate category, an A. But, impute, yeah. but both of these are quite common. You could also try and like a classification model to impute it, but um, I don't think that's actually commonly done. I think just having a new category and A allows like if you have a powerful enough model, then this would work well. Basically, we are 
We are deciding about the middle area without any problem. How can we I mean, this is, uh, the question is, why is the middle area the way it is? And um, I mean, we'll talk a little bit, in a little bit about behavior of linear models, but that's like, that's hard to say. <laughs> and I mean, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, but I mean, this is a plane in the original, in the 3D space. So it's gonna be a straight line here. And if you look in this space, or sorry, a pl yeah, a plane here, and this, it will make sense in this space. But then projecting back, it might look a little bit odd. All right. So the other type of feature that very commonly is added, um, particularly for linear models, is adding polynomial features. So here, I think this is, um, so here, uh, I think it's just some synthetic data. You can see that, okay, with the linear model, so if the input feature is on the x-axis, the a-target is on the y-axis, with the linear model, I can kind of fit it, and it looks reasonable, but clearly there's sort of um, a nonlinear trend that I don't capture. And um, by adding polynomial features, um, you basically make this into a polynomial regression problem. So now instead of fitting just a line, you fit a polynomial. You can do this in scikit-learn with polynomial features. Polynom fe polynomial features actually adds uh, polynomials and interactions of a given degree. By default, it's degree two. So what does this mean? Here in this case, um, we have only had only one input feature, and now we add a second input feature, which is just uh, this feature squared. So now we have x and x squared. If we had more features, we would, for each feature, add um, that feature squared and also products of all two pairs of features. So polynomial features, by default, looks at all possible interactions. And so this is a way you can very easily expand your feature space quite a bit. and. Um, so you can basically make any algorithm be a polynomial algorithm using make pipelines with polynomial features. So by default, it's two, uh, but you can uh, use higher degree polynomials. Um, sometimes three works. Above three usually doesn't work that well anymore, and you get a really big explosion of features. So now I want to talk about um, how we can actually use these features in a linear model and how to train a linear model. So you're all probably uh, at least a little bit familiar with how linear models work. So here is um, a 1D case uh, where input on the x-axis, target on the y-axis, and um, linear models are actually called linear models because they're linear and the parameter is W. Um, and so we have the target y hat is um, the inner product of some coefficient vector w and our data x. So in the 1D case, w would just be the slope. And x would be one input feature. And there's an offset b. That's also called uh, bias or intercept. And so basically, for each input feature, um, so here there would be p features. For each input feature, you have a coefficient um, wi, you multiply the coefficient times the feature, and then add b. So in the most basic form, this is um, also linear in the features, but you don't have to, it doesn't have to be linear in the features. As we just talked about, I can add um, squares and polynomials or whatever other, uh, like derived features of the original features in there. It would still be a linear model because it's linear in the parameters. So this is um, the formula for predicting with any of the any linear model, basically, uh, for regression. The difference between different linear models is how do we find this w and b from the training data set. So the most basic form of this is called ordinarily squares. Okay, I should have been a little bit cleaner with this. Uh, sometimes I put in the B and sometimes I don't put in the B. 
imagine there always being a B, but um, you can also absorb the B into the W by adding a new constant feature, but uh, I should actually have put it in it to make it more clear. Um, anyway, so let's see, you compute the minimum over W and B of W transpose uh, XI minus yi squared. So what it says is we want to find the coefficients so that on the training set, oh my god, this shouldn't be p. This should be, sorry, this should be n. So we sum over all the training points, and we want that um, w transpose xi is as close as possible to yi. So we want to find w that makes the least mistakes on the training set. Um, this has a unique solution if uh, X has full column rank, which means that basically there's no linear dependencies within the data, and it means we have more, um, more samples than we have features. So this is kind of nice because uh, it's very easy to solve. Um, Gauss already did this. And uh, you probably did it at some point uh, in high school or undergrad. The problem is if there's uh, linear dependencies between the features, this breaks down. And also, if you have more features than you have samples, this also breaks down. Finally, it's kind of nice that there's nothing, no hyperparameters to tune. But on the other hand, it might be good if, we if there is a way for us to control the complexity of our model. Here, the complexity of the model is given basically by the number of input features. So a model that's quite similar um, to this is rich regression. But rich regression adds another term to it, which is this alpha times uh, w squared. So here, the first term is the same, and it says, I want to make good prediction on the training data. But the second term um, says, I want W to be small. I want W to be close to zero. So we have basically two different goals here that are traded off against each other. One is make good prediction on the training data set. The other one is be close to zero. This be close to zero should be read as I want the solution to be simple, as in I, I want there to be uh, a small slope along all features. If, so if alpha is not equal to zero, this always has a unique solution. And now we have a tuning parameter alpha. If we set alpha to zero, this will be ordinarily squares. If we set alpha to infinity, the solution would be completely zero because um, you would just make W zero to solve the problem. And so for alpha in between, you have a trade-off between these two objectives. This is actually um, an instantiation of something that's uh, much more general, and that's the basis of nearly all supervised learning, which I want to touch on briefly, which is called um, regularized empirical risk minimization. So th this is basically nearly all of supervised learning looks like this. You have a family of functions, capital F. So for us, this is here, this is linear models. I want to find the best function in this family of functions so that the loss, whoa, the loss between the function evaluated on my training data and the true target is small, summed over all of the uh, training points. So L here was um, uh, least squares, or like squared, uh, squared distances for us. But it could be a different way to measure how bad a prediction is. Plus, alpha times the regularizer, where um, Alpha is the tuning parameter, and R is some measure of complexity of um, the function f. So here, this was just the Euclidean, no the squared Euclidean norm of the coefficients. 
But this is sort of the more general form that we're using here. And um, so basically, you have this shooting parameter and a trade-off between these two objectives, fitting the training data well, and having um, a simple function where R defines what simple means. And so you can basically cast all um, support vector machines, neural networks, gradient boosting in this framework. Uh, hopefully this uh, reminds you a little bit of what we talked about before about model, model complexity. So here this alpha is an instance of um, what I talked be before about model complexity where you can control um, how well you perform on the training data set versus how well you generalize. And here we made this very explicit. It's very clear that if I um, reduce Yes, if I reduce alpha, if I set alpha to zero, I'll be very good on the training data set. I will be as good as possible on the training data set. If I um, increase alpha, then I would get uh, worse and worse on the training data set because I push my coefficients more and more closer to zero. But I also restrict my modeling or the complexity of my model so that hopefully I can get better generalization. So I want to run an example uh, of this uh, for the Boston House and data set that we, set, that we saw before. So here, as a rounder, we have 13 features. Here I plotted all of these features against the target, which is the house price in a Boston neighborhood. And we knew they all have like um, slightly different scales or very different scales. So, First off, what I'm going to do is um, I do cross validation. I compare linear regression. Linear regression implements ordinarily squares in scikit-learn, and you see the outcome is an R square of 0.717. I can also use rich regression, which is um, the added penalty of keeping the coefficient small. By default, alpha is equal to one, and the results about the same. Um, Oh yeah, just a reminder, I uh, wanted to put up the formula for the R-square, which is uh, this here. So the R-square between um, the true values and predictions is one minus um, the variance on uh, the training, well, sorry, the variance on the evaluation set, um, one minus, sorry, the, d the distance between true and predicted squared divided by um, the variance on the, uh, on the set. Um, this can be, bi be uh, negative for biased estimators, or it can also be negative for an unbiased estimator if you do it on a test set. Though, if you use this definition, uh, which is the definition used in uh, scikit-learn, so your R squared can be negative. Um, some people are confused by this, but if you just look at the formula, it's uh, quite clear how this can happen. But R square being negative basically means you're doing worse than predicting the mean. So um, if we do regularization, it actually matters what the scale of our features are. So um, we should. Uh, scale our features, so here I use the center scaler and then evaluate rich again, and then I forgot to output the test score, which, is, which didn't really change. So the next step would be searching over um, the parameters, searching over different values of alpha, and so um, this is usually done on a log scale, so here I'm searching over values from 0 0.001 to 1000, on like a logarithmic grid, and uh, I put this into research CV, put it on the training data set, and then visualize it. What you can see here is that basically there's quite a bit of variance in the test scores, and you can also see that basically very small alpha are best, and there's not really a difference between the different small values. So what this means is that Basically, you didn't need the regularization on this data set. Um, 
because of the number of samples, number of features, so we had, um, let me go back, we had 500 samples and 13 features. Apparently they were not very collinear, so um, linear regression without a penalty does a good job. This is what this graph is telling us. Basically, if I, if I don't use any regularization, uh, I'm doing as good as I ever will. But so now, uh, let's do a little bit of feature engineering and add some more features to give the models more flexibility. So what I'll do is I use polynomial features, as I said before. This will add all the interaction features and the squared of all of the features. Um, I'm not using a pipeline here mostly to keep the slides simple. I probably should be using a pipeline. Um, so now we have 500 um, samples and 104 features. So now the number of features is quite big compared to the number of samples. Again, I run my linear regression, which is ordinarily squares, and I run a ridge regression. And I can see now, okay, the ridge regression does uh, a tiny bit better. Now I run the same grid search again, and I can see that actually, uh, if I tune the parameter alpha correctly, I can get better. So here, the parameter alpha, if it's somewhere between um, 10 and 100, so here, I think the, the best I was found was 31.6. This gives us um, the best R squared of 0.83, which is quite a bit better than what we saw before. So here you can see that basically, if I um, add more features, the model is more likely to overfit, and the uh, ordinarily squares has a harder time fitting the problem. And then uh, using a regularization can make sense. If already your number of features is quite small compared to the number of samples, then regularization usually doesn't, doesn't change a lot. So if you have thousands of samples and tens of features, probably you don't need to regularize. But either way, um, you can run a grid search, and a grid search will tell you whether you should regularize or not. So another benefit of regularization can be that you get a somewhat more stable solution. So this is, so here I, I fit, fitted logistic regret, sorry, linear regression uh, on this larger feature space, and I got, um, oh, yeah? Yes. So, with, what is a good practice in general? We saw that with linear regression, we are getting better results. And while adding more features, we can repopulate the question. So, this is a good practice. So, what do we consider? I mean, so the question is. Um, okay, uh, the question is what is good practice uh, to do here? And I think it's, um, I mean, the idea is to try out how will different models behave. Ideally, for each of these, I would plot how exactly um, the errors behave and like how well the fit is. Um, so you could actually, if you go back, here, you, can, you could plot the fit here, and it's pretty obvious that uh, polynomial fe uh, features are make more sense here. Um, so, I mean, the best practice is actually looking at your data. Uh, the other th uh, thing is that I'm doing here is basically, I look at, um, am I overfitting or underfitting? And in the original data set, basically, I, I had the feeling my model was too simple. So, um, I didn't look between test and um, training and test set, but I'm pretty sure they were very close together. Um, because basically, the, if linear regression works, it's uh, very unlikely to overfit. Or I'm, I'm pretty sure it didn't overfit in that case. And so I wanted to add more complexity and hope that a more complex model will do better. That's why I added more features. But then as a consequence of adding more features, I needed to regularize the model. Does it, did this answer the question? No? Yeah, one of the questions is, uh, does it, is it not adding 
Oh yeah, it's definitely adding multicollinearities. For the for the regularized model, it's uh, definitely okay. it's the, the regularized model doesn't care about multicollinearities, and so I'm going to talk to the, come to this in like uh, two slides or something. But um, interpreting the coefficients will be harder, and you don't really get um, good confidence intervals for your coefficients. But this is not what basically this class is about. This class is about creating predictive models. And if you care about making a good predictive model, it doesn't matter at all. No, uh, the question is, if we have more data points, do we start uh, regularization? No. If you add more data, you'll become less likely to overfit, at, at least here, because this is a parametric model. So I, had, I have 13 coefficients. No matter how much data I add, I will only have these 13 coefficients that I can adjust. And if I get more and more data to adjust these 13 coefficients, I will just get them better and better, and I will overfit less and less. Um, if I had a, like a tree-based model um, that's uh, non-parametric, um, it might be slightly different. But usually, um, having more data means you op having more samples means you overfit less. Okay, so the question is, is the problem here that the features are collinear, or is it a problem general of linear regression? And I would say it's, um, it's more general. Basically, the features become collinear if you add enough. So, I mean, just by the linear algebra math of it, I can, if I have 500 data points, if I have more than 500 features, they will be collinear, by definition. The rank of the matrix can only be like the number of data points. So if I created 600 features, even if they're completely independent in the r real world, the matrix will they will be collinear in the matrix, right? Um, so basically, if you have too many features, yeah, th they will all, they will always be collinear uh, unless you have more samples to distinguish them. So here's an illustration of what happens if you have collinear features with linear regression. Um, so this is, the model actually performed reasonably well, but if you look at the coefficients, the coefficients, um, so the main thing I want you to look at is this guy here, which says the coefficients are between two and minus five with 11 zeros. So um, this model, like these coefficients make no sense because um, basically these two uh, coefficients cancel each other out because there is some uh, collinearity in, in the data. And so um, like nothing in the, um, the target variable is not big enough to vary uh, coefficients that big. So there must be some cancellation going on. And um, clearly this is sort of not the kind of coefficients that I would, I would want from a stable model. If we uh, just use the original features, this would look much more reasonable. Um, so here is the coefficients after doing grid search with uh, Ridge. So this was uh, alpha equal to 31 or something like this. And you can see that the coefficients are much more nicely behaved because they're actually between minus three and three and don't have 11 zeros. And they're also all pretty much on the same scale. I just colored them by whether they're positive or negative. We can also see the influence of the alpha parameter on the coefficients. So here I have alpha being um, 1, 14, or 10. I think I, I used 14 here because in a different run of the grid search CV, it uh, had 14 at the optimum. There's probably not a lot of difference between the 14 and the 30. So what you can see here is basically that 
the more you increase alpha, the more the coefficients go towards zero, which is exactly what alpha does. You can also see that they go at different speeds. So here, for example, um, this, um, this coefficient from alpha equal to 1 to alpha equal to 100 goes towards 0 very quickly. So it was very important at alpha equal to 1. It's not very important at alpha equal to 100, where this coefficient was le less important at alpha equal to 1 and is still quite important. It's the most important one, actually, at alpha equal to 100. So you can see that the coefficients are actually quite strongly influenced uh, by the, the regularization parameter. So that makes it quite a bit harder to um, interpret what these coefficients mean. And so I would caution you in doing that. Because the feature that is most important with one parameterization might not be the most important with another one. If you look closely, you can actually see some of the coefficients flip the sign if you change the regularization. So that means they're related like to high house prices according to one model and to low house prices according to the other model, um, which means you probably shouldn't trust either of them. Another way I find interesting to visualize um, these, um, how this regularization works is using learning curves. Learning curves are not the same as training curves. So here what's on the x-axis is not like iterations or something like this, but it's training set size. So I, fi I fix um, my data set and I subsample this data set. And I look how well does the model perform if I just give it part of the data. This shows you, um, or it allows you to extrapolate what will happen to the models as I collect more data. And also, how much data do I actually need to train a model? And so here, the different, um, so the dotted lines are the training scores, the solid lines are the test scores, and um, there's different models. Red is the ordinarily squares, and then there's rich with different values of alpha. And you can see that um, basically, if you have very little data, um, then um, using linear regression, like giving a fixed number of features, that's pretty badly. Um, and, uh, but over, and overfits the training data very, uh, quite a lot. You can see that the very unregularized model, alpha equal to one, also overfits the data basically as much as the um, linear regression model does. As you, uh, as you add more and more features, this overfitting basically goes away and you can, um, sorry, as you add more samples, this overfitting goes away and uh, the linear regression model behaves more and more like the um, more regularized models. So here, for a very small data set, you can see that doing alpha equal to 14 is much, much better because it prevents overfitting. But then as I get, uh, if I use more training data, the regularization doesn't help that much anymore. And um, basically using um, just linear regression is fine. Okay, so there's two questions. One is, if we're looking at predictive models, is this model no good? And um, I mean, technically, if it's cross-validating, fine, it's fine. But uh, I mean, there's some numeric inst instability going on, so I would rather use the regularized model um, because it might be hard to predict what, what's happening. Uh, um, so 
if, if something has a weird value in the feature corresponding to this coefficient, I will get completely nonsensical results. Oh, and um, by the way, these are not all zero, even though it might look like it. These have, all of these others, they have like normal magnitude. They just look zero because this, is, this has 11 zeros behind it. Um, the other question was, uh, can we see how um, stable or unstable coefficients are um, function of the regularization? Um, and that's a slide that I now regret having taken out uh, 10 minutes ago or 10 minutes before the lecture, which you can look at um, what's called um, coefficient paths. So you can look, you can visualize for all the coefficients, how do they evolve if you um, increase or decrease regularization. So if you increase it basically to infinity, they will all be zero, but how, how do they go to zero? And which ones are important and how long are they important? Um, I mean, but then, so you can look at this, um, but then it's a little bit like, to leave reading because, um, I mean, you can say, say, okay, maybe in this model, this was important and then it was not important anymore, but which of these coefficients is really important in this regularized model is something that's like, I'm not sure if it makes sense to argue about that. All right, so this was a uh, rigid regression now there's another model I want to talk about briefly, more or less briefly, um, which is uh, lasso regression. This is very similar to rich regression, but the difference is now in um, how we penalize W, and here we're using the L1 norm, uh, which means the absolute values. So again, we want to fit, the first term here says we want to fit our train data set, and the second term says we want our model to be simple. But now simple is measured using um, absolute values instead of, uh, instead of squared, uh, a sum of squares. And this has um, an interesting effect, which is that it makes some of the coefficients w be exactly zero. And now I have, uh, I think, three slides trying to convince you why this happens. Um, like if, if you, uh, are good with convex optimization and Lagrangian duals, you can uh, see this maybe, but otherwise it's not super obvious. So the motivation for this is actually um, trying to get a model that's sparse, meaning we have, what is a good model that uses as le the few, sorry, that uses the least amount of features possible? Like if we have a model that only uses a couple of the features, this model will be very explainable and we might uh, in some cases, expect it uh, to generalize better. If we can have a good model using only four of 40 features, that would be great. Um, so the motivation is actually um, we want f few, we want a model that fits the data well and has few non-zero coefficients. Non-zero coefficients would be the L0 norm, um, which is the number of non-zero elements. So here you can see that um, um, the, the three norms. So this L2 norm is what we had for rich, how it penalized. L1 norm is uh, for lasso, and the L0 norm is basically what we actually wanted, which would mean or what we want for lasso, which is have few non-zero coefficients. The problem with this is that um, it's like a super spiky function that's basically impossible to optimize. Actually, it's uh, NP-hard to optimize this function. And so um, we basically give up on this and use um, a relaxation. So in a sense, this here is um, a, re a relaxation of this for the optimization problem that we can actually solve. So our goal is actually to have few, few non-zero coefficients. We can't compute this, so now we use the L1 norm. And maybe somewhat surprisingly, the L1 norm um, gives us uh, something similar. And so here, I try to have an illustration of this. So let's see, say we have a quadratic function f. Th let's say this is the function that is the first part of our loss term, the fitting the data part. 
This is some quadratic function. I just made up one and put it there. So this is what the fitting the data part looks like. Now, if we um, add the L2 norm, so here this would be as a function of the co coefficients. So x here would be the coefficients. If, if we add the L2 norm, we added another um, quadratic function. And so here, orange is L2 norm regularized, another quadratic function. It's basically, we shrank it, we, we made it be like closer to zero a little bit. So we made um, the function higher when it's away from zero, um, which is sort of what the L2 norm does. If we use the L1 norm, um, instead, we can see the green thing comes out, and you can see the green thing because it's a combination of the absolute value and um, uh, the quadratic function. Now it has like this kink at zero, and so this kink basically means that if you do this minimization, it's more likely to actually hit exactly the zero, like. Doing the L2 norm, okay, before the optimum was maybe here. With the orange, the optimum is maybe here. And if you increase alpha, the optimum will, will slowly wander over there. But with the L1 norm, basically you create this kink that is very likely to happen at zero. Another picture that tries to illustrate this, um, which is um, basically, you can look at the um, L1, the L2 penalties as, as restricting yourself to contours of the norm. Um, so basically, uh, if, let's say I want my, the Euclidean distance to be small, so I want to use the L2 penalty. It basically means I look at, this, at the circle which is everything was a constant L2 norm, and I look at the best point on the circle. And for, whereas for the L1 norm, I would look at the best point on, uh, on the diamond. And now, again, if we have like a quadratic function, um, which I illustrated here using these um, level sets, if I um, look at the intersection of the level sets with a circle, the intersection will just happen anywhere. If I look at the intersection of the level sets with the diamond, because the shape of the diamond, the solution will likely be at the corners of the diamond. What this means is basically that, I mean, these corners are, um, mean, mean that some of the uh, components are exactly zero. And maybe I convinced you, otherwise you, can, you have, just have to believe me, because uh, you can try it out and you'll see that's what's gonna happen. So lasso is nice if you want few coefficients to be non-zero. In general, uh, it will not give you better predictive a more predictive model unless the true model is sparse. So if, in, if there's a true linear model out there in the world, and it depends on many of the um, features, then this will give you not as good a fit, obviously. If you expect only a few of your uh, features are actually important, this might give you a better fit. We'll always give you so, a somewhat more interpretable model. So here I do the same thing. I, I grid search alpha on a log, on a log scale from 0 0.001 to 1,000. Um, the best alpha value is 0 0.001. Th so this is on the Boston Housing data set with the polynomial expansion. So this is not entirely as good as uh, it was using rich regression. So um, the question is, if the if sort of in the real world the process only depends on a couple of features, will linear regression 
um, be able to learn this and it will not get exactly zero coefficients. It will never get exactly zero coefficients, no matter what. Um, because basically, yeah, because of the optimization problem, um, you will be slightly off from zero or further off from zero. So um, if I use the Lasso regression, I'm, not, I'm interested in the coefficients. Um, would it be feasible to use Lasso to see which coefficients matter and then use a linear model uh, without regularization uh, with these uh, coefficients as inputs and then interpret um, the coefficients of that model? Or okay, the question is, um, can we use this lasso only for selecting the features, selecting only nonlinear uh, components, and then use a new um, model that's not regularized only on these interpreted by the lasso? And uh, yeah, that's certainly a thing you can do, and that's, people do that. Um, I'm not sure if it's better in some sense than just fitting the lasso itself. Um, it's very easy to do this with scikit-learn with select from model, and we're going to talk about this in a couple of lectures. It's, yeah. So, so I assume that with Lasso, um, we have similar concerns with regards to interpre interpreting the coefficients as we have with Rich because of the regularization, right? So yeah, w with Lasso, we have similar concerns with respect to interpretation. Another, but we actually also have concerns with respect to which features they select. If features are um, collinear or like very dependent, Lasso will randomly select one of a group of correlated features. So, yeah. Anyway, so here's the here's the tuning curve for um, Lasso, and. Um, so you can see that actually um, it picked, I think it picked something that is on the edge of uh, what I allowed, or no, maybe it's, I think it picked something here. But basically you need only very little regression with the lasso for this problem. Here's the coefficients. So I set, set the ones that are um, zero to white, and you can see of the 104 coefficients, only 64 were non-zero on this problem but the model was not entirely as good as the rich model. So, in the last three minutes I wanna talk about elastic net, which basically combines the two. So here we have two parameters, alpha one and alpha two. One is an L1 penalty, one is an L2 penalty. This now means you have two parameters to tune, which makes it a little bit harder to use, but also it makes it more flexible. So basically, this model interpolates between um, ordinarily squares, rich, and lasso. And so, in principle, you can run grid search over it and find the best model among all of these. So, uh, here, if you look at the unit balls for these norms, basically the unit ball for lasso is like a dented, dented ball, which is like this purple line or blue line maybe uh, here. So the lasso still has like so, some, uh, some edges at the corners, but they're sort of much flatter than they are for uh, L1 norm. Um, the way this is parameterized in scikit-learn is um, you have an alpha and then you have a, a parameter called L1 ratio that's the relative amount of L1 penalty. So if L1 ratio is zero, it's gonna be rich. If L1 ratio is one, it's gonna be less so. Um, people often use something close to one, I think. So something that's mostly rich with a little bit of less so. So it only sets coefficients to zero if you're very certain. So now you can do grid search over this if you want. So it's implemented in the elastic net model. So here I use, again, a logarithmic grid for alpha, and then I use some pretty arbitrary grid for the L1 ratio. And um, I actually see that having L1 ratio very small is the best here. So probably L1 ratio equal to zero might have been even better. Uh, so rich would be good, a good model for this problem. 
uh, whenever I run grid search, grid search, I want to look at the um, outcomes. So here is a 2D heat map of um, the results. And we can see that basically all the, all the good stuff happens, uh, happens here. And so actually, I can get away with um, a higher L1 ratio if I set the alpha to be higher, which is confusing to me. OK. So yeah, so any parameter here in the diagonal would be fine. But looking at this plot, I can see that um, and I can see what the interaction is between the two parameters, and I can also see if the ranges that I picked uh, were, were good. All right, any more questions? All right, then I'll see you on Wednesday.